You know, one of the things I want to talk about is a question that I received on Facebook uh, recently. It's uh, from Nellie, who says, Hi, Hank. Hope you're doing well. My prayers uh, to you. I have a question. If God never gets tired, never sleeps, why does the Bible say in Genesis 2, 2, that he rested from all his work. And this is sort of in line with the first question. I mean, uh, the question becomes, how do you read Scripture in light of Scripture? How do you read the Bible in the sense in which it is intended? And what's going on in this particular case, Nelly, is uh, what's known as an anthropomorphism, which means that God is speaking in, in the way of a human being. He's condescending to our level to explain things at our level, because if he explained things to us on, on, on his level, we, we simply wouldn't get it. It's kind of like trying to explain Einstein to a small neck clam. Um, so th th this means, in essence, that God stopped his work of creation. Uh, we know from Scripture so many things for example, Isaiah says explicitly, don't you know, have you not heard the Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He will not grow tired or weary and his understanding no one can fathom. Right there you have a very, very clear indication that if you're reading scripture in light of scripture, that this could not possibly mean that God actually grows tired. But, but I think there's more. Normal people, and I'm not suggesting that Nellie's not normal, but I'm just saying normally. Maybe that's probably a better way of putting it. Normally, people have an intuitive grasp on how literary devices work. So when Scripture speaks of God's right hand, or if Scripture talks about his mighty arm, there's an intuitive understanding of comparison. Comparison with dissimilarity. And how that works is pretty cool. The claim is not that God has human limbs. The claim is that God is powerful. In other words, the inner meaning is far greater than the outer image. Now, when the outer image is more significant than the inner meaning, we're no longer talking about metaphor. Resurrection is a classic example of that. Uh, a metaphorical meaning of resurrection weakens the impact of the text, and that helps us to understand that the metaphor is not in view in case of resurrection. So when people say, you know, resurrection, just metaphorical, kind of like what we're going through right now, spring is going to become summer, winter turns to spring, you know, the change of seasons, that's kind of like resurrection. So you see that the buds come back on the trees, the bunnies are back out, and so we have a, a metaphor for how death gives way to life. And no, this is not a metaphor at all. This is an actual historical event. And when you read the Bible again, reading Scripture and light of Scripture, you see that Scripture is very, very clear on this point. Now, Paul makes a four-part argument in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where he says that Jesus Christ suffered fatal torment. He says that the tomb was empty. Christianity cannot survive an identifiable tomb containing the corpse of Christ. The tomb was empty. It didn't contain the corpse of Christ because it ridden from the, he had risen from the dead. Then he says he appeared and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. And Paul makes great note of the fact that some of the people he appeared to were still alive, and therefore they were available to be cross-examined if indeed this were not the case, if he had not indeed risen from the dead. But I think the greatest argument ultimately uh, leans on the fact that there's a transformation of the disciples, and most notably the Apostle Paul himself where he says, I'm the least of the apostles. I don't deserve to be called apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach. And this is what you believed. Again, why did you believe it? 
Well, we had blind faith. No, 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 it's not blind faith. It's faith in irrefutable fact. I mean, here are people who are willing to die for the notion that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and is therefore God. 